But I wanted to uh, get started and welcome everyone for the first uh, public lecture in the Jewish Studies program this quarter, this year, um, uh, by Professor Moshe Idel, who hardly needs any introduction. Um, he is our uh, David Lobel visiting professor, um, so to speak, the inaugural um, uh, visiting professor, and we are indeed very, extremely, beyond words, privileged to have uh, Professor Moshe Adel um, come to Stanford. Uh, he's been here for uh, the last two days and taught um, our undergraduate class on Jewish uh, mysticism uh, yesterday afternoon, and um, then also met with the graduate students in our Zohar reading group. And in fact, the class, the undergraduate class, is built uh, around Professor Idel's visit. Um, he's, uh, uh, he's the first in a series of public lectures that is connected with this class. Uh, and the information on the series of lectures is around campus, also on the door. Um, in two weeks, we have uh, Danny Matt coming, um, uh, who is going to talk on the Zohar, and uh, then Alan Siegel from Barnard College and uh, Dr. Giller from Los Angeles. Uh, so there's more lectures to come. Um, the center of the enterprise is uh, Professor Idel's visit. He is uh, uh, the Max Cooper, and I'm just going to confine my introductory notes to a um, couple of things. He's the um, Max Cooper. Uh, professor of Jewish thought at Hebrew, Hebrew University, and he's also a fellow, permanent fellow at the Hartman Institute, where I think I met you first uh, in the mid 90s. Um, and he, in a way, is uh, somewhat also of a wandering Maggid, um, as he is probably spends more time on the plane than uh, on the ground. Not entirely, but um, lectures uh, all around the world, Europe, the US, and um, I'm not going to count up all the uh, public lectures. Um, he's also uh, not just, of course, Jewish studies thought, but uh, extremely interdisciplinary. And uh, Kabbalah, anyhow, has inherent interest to a number of fields. He has collaborated with neurologists and, as we heard yesterday, uh, computer scientists and very unexpected fields that are apparently related to Jewish mysticism. Uh, in some thought, the, uh, some way, the internet, of course, uh, yeah, has its own mystique. But um, he has uh, published so many, uh, so many books that I couldn't carry them all over uh, for show and tell. And I'm not going to list all of them because uh, that would take a while. But um, uh, uh, the first one, well, the dissertation is on the Enfant Terrible of. Uh, of um, of Kabbalah, um, Abu Lafia, which uh, was, was also the first published book. But then I think uh, he really established himself as um, the what is now dubbed by uh, not just Amazon.com, but that's where I got, got it most recently, as the foremost scholar of Kabbalah in the world. Um, the New Perspectives book, that's why my, my one show and tell from 1989, uh, award-winning, the winner of the National Jewish Book Award and Jewish Scholarship of that year, and then since, man, since then many books, also on the copy, uh, topic of today, uh, Eros and Kabbalah, actually Kabbalah and Eros in the book uh, in 2005, um, and then most recently, um, most recently, uh, this book, um, and you see all these books are many pages, so <laughs> very, very extremely prolific uh, on Ben Sonship in Jewish mysticism, which seems at first um, first um, sight a little bit strange topic, Sonship with O, not uh, with you, uh, but very exciting. Also, uh, winner of the National Jewish Book Award again. I don't know how many people won the New Jewish National Jewish Book Award um, twice, two times. Um, but of course, very exciting topic because the sun, one would commonsensically think, think is the, um, the Christian topic um, by definition. And so this is an exploration of the uh, hypostatic sun, a divine sonship, a sonship in Jewish mysticism and uh, bridges uh, the entire um, uh, length of Jewish mysticism from classical Judaism through modernity, Freud included. Um, so with that, um, I would just say that um, 
the field of Kabbalah, of course, is, has been to a certain degree dominated by the father, like more than any other field, probably in Jewish studies, by the father, I guess, from Sholem. And there are many sons and related um, nephews, or whatever you would say, um, who have, in the meantime, been trying to kill the father figure. Um, <laughs> but I think uh, Professor Idel has established himself as someone who didn't fall into the psychological need to kill the father. But that the last book is on sonship, hence, is very interesting also. So with that, uh, I would hand it over to you. And um, please help me welcome Professor Idel. <laughs> Thank you very much for the generous introduction, which is reminding me of an eulogy. But uh, uh, I hope that nevertheless I shall have more to say, not only now, but also later. Uh, and thank you very much again for the invitation and for the very, very nice treatment while I'm here. Given the fact that I believe that all of you read my book, I'm not going to speak about what is written there, but tangentially, and attempt to go a little bit beyond what's written in a book published, written in 2003 and published in 2005. Okay, now it's better. Or even just to lower it a little bit. Ah, lower, okay. It's in front of your face right now. Okay, so. In the 40 minutes I have, I would like to address a lot of topics. Uh, but one important issue that I would like to emphasize is the fact that uh, one way to look to Jewish culture is uh, to understand it as a culture of eros. What eros is, I shall try to de describe in a moment. By, but my assumption is that eros was not just one dimension, which is very human and natural, but it was conceived to be in rabbinic literature, and then even more in Kabbalah and in Hasidism, the most important topic of Jewish mysticism, the most important topic, which is not, in my opinion, a departure or a breakthrough in Judaism, but a continuation of lines which are found in the Bible, in rabbinic literature, and then intensified by the Kabbalists and the Hasidic masters. So let me start with a short introduction to the history of religion in general, in three minutes. <laughs> the prevalent trend in understanding religion, dictated basically by Hegel, assumes that religion evaluated from a more tribal, concrete, collective, primitive, archaic form of religion towards something which is much more sophisticated, individualistic, and what's more important, spiritual. So that's the history of religion. Hegel believed that the most abstract form of religion is the best, the highest, the latest. And what came earlier has some much more limited aspects which are transcended by the development. This theory was elaborated later on by another German philosopher, Karl Jäger who claimed that in the fifth, sixth century before common era, there was a breakthrough, what he called an actual breakthrough, that in the same period, prophets in Israel, philosophers in Greece, thinkers like the Upanishads in uh, India, created a more individualistic and intellectual form of religion, which evaluated with time. And that's another version of Hegel, a vision in which the collective 
and the material is conceived to be inferior. And the direction of development would turn those elements into obsolete. That can be easily seen also in the case of the treatment of Eros. If you look in Plato, and in the Western tradition deeply influenced by Plato, you are going to see that real Eros is the intellectual Eros, the love of philosophy, the contemplation of ideas, the ascent from his world to the supernal place where the ideas of beauty are found. So we can speak about a moment in which a certain dualism was introduced, in which the material, corporeal, tribal, national, is transcended by a vision which is much more individualistic and intellectual, including the idea of Eros. So Plato started with the idea that there is a lower Eros and a higher Eros. That has a deep impact on Christianity, which is basically saying something very similar, and even intensifying what Plato only hinted at, at by creating new institutions like monasteries in which people, men and women, were dedicated actually to contemplation rather than to the material corporeal errors. So this is the direction of the West in which spiritualization is the main line of development. Such a vision of religion was adopted by a lot of scholars, implicitly or explicitly. I cannot enter now in all the debates about the topic. There were also reactions against it, Mircea Eliade, but that's a topic I cannot enter here. But even in Jewish studies, you can find it very easily. This acceptance of a vector coming from the corporate personality of the people and moving toward the contemplation of the intellectual God by the individual, Maimonides, Spinoza, and so on. My claim is that that is indeed to a certain extent true. But the main line of development in Judaism didn't accept this vision. And this history of religion is pertinent for a very small part of Judaism, while the more massive contributions to the development of Judaism go in other directions. <coughs> and from this point of view, the term eros should be understood in Judaism not just as a departure from the corporeal toward the spiritual, but almost always as a combination of what Plato would say it is material and spiritual love. And that's the point I would like to make here by explaining some aspects that, that I selected from a larger choice. So in the Bible, we have three four, maybe five, depends how you like to divide, major attitudes which involve some form of eros. Genesis, chapter 1, 2, marriage is conceived to be a return of the female to the male, very corporeal, to become one flesh, nothing platonic there. Song of Songs, nothing a platonic there. There is love, there is longing, but the ideal is not a platonic life, a love. Model number three, the obligations of the husband to his wife according to the Pentateuch. The obligation includes only concrete issues, including sex as a religious obligation, not love. 
Number four, to finish with the Bible. In some Proverbs, the idea is that the entire people of Israel is described as the woman of God. In my opinion, in many parts of the Bible, God is not a single, but he is catholically married with a corporate personality named Israel. And that's a very, very strong relation. And you can easily see it in prophets like Isaiah and Oshea. So those are major visions of love in which the concrete is quintessential. There's nothing like an individual which is treated as the center of love, but the nation versus God, the husband versus the spouse, and so on. We don't have asceticism in the Hebrew Bible at least. <coughs> And those four major directions continue within rabbinic literature, which intensifies them. I cannot enter now the details, but I would like to discuss one moment of intensification found in rabbinic literature. One example, which in my opinion suffices in order to make the point of rabbinic Judaism as a culture of love. According to two major texts found in the Talmud, in the Holy of the Holies, in the temple, there was supposed to be, I didn't say there was, but that was written in Talmud, a couple of two cherubs found in a sexual union. That was supposed to be the content of the Holy of the Holies, according to rabbinic literature. Since rabbinic literature was not a Victorian literature, they are speaking about, in a very, very clear way, about what happens in the Holy of the Holies. According to two texts, when the pilgrims arrived to Jerusalem, they were shown this couple of two cherubs in a sexual encounter as the symbol of the love of God to the people of Israel and vice versa. For me, that is the center, the central symbol in the rabbinic literature, dealing with a very important place, a very important topic expressed in a sexual imagery. So given the occurrence of those forms of imagery in the Bible, their repercussion in rabbinic literature, and their, and their intensification in rabbinic literature, what happens in, in the rabbinic, in Kabbalistic literature, we have another intensification, which can be summarized as follows. The entire Jewish ritual is conceived to be a tool for creating a sexual encounter between God and his female counterpart, known basically as Shekhinah. In my opinion, I summarized the most important tenet of the main line of Kabbalah. You can say, OK, that's your reading. Maybe there are other readings. For sure, there are also other readings. However. The most important slogan, which emerges in Kabbalah, and is repeated millions of times, is that someone performs the commandments, and now I'm quoting, in all, uh, for the sake of the union between God and his Shekhinah. That is, in my opinion, the most important sentence repeated in Kabbalah more than anything else. So that's a statistical issue. That is not only a matter of the Kabbalists. This formula entered, in fact, the most important book in Judaism. You know what, what it is? I'm not sure you know. No. 
The most important book in Judaism is the prayer book. It was used by most of the Jews most of the time, even when they didn't understand it. And look in the prayer book. We can find the formula, the Aramaic formula, the Shem Yichut for the union, sexual union of God and his Shekhinah, repeated in who knows how, how many millions of Siduri were printed and used daily by Jews. That's why I believe that is the center. So let me explain now what is the meaning of something like this. Yes, I shall try to explain what is the meaning of the statement that the Kabbalists perform commandments, all the commandments, in order to induce a sexual union between God and his female counterpart. That's the center of Kabbalah, in my opinion. In order to understand why it's so important, you can say, oh, that is a monotheistic statement. God should be one. And if there is a rapture within divinity, we must attempt to heal it in order to have one God. That's an interesting reading. Excuse me? more Hebrew. Uh, <laughs> so so uh, one reading would be that the Kabbalist is concerned with what is called the most important contribution of Judaism to religion, monotheism. However, I believe that's not the only reading. It's a correct reading, but not the only one. More important seems to me to be that in this statement, we have an implication related to the most important commandment in Judaism, which is what? Procreation. Sorry. The most important commandment is not to study and not to do anything. The most important, first and most important commandment is conceived to be procreation. That's what God said in the first chapter. You should procreate. And then the Kabbalists accepted this priority. And that became, for many, many Kabbalists, the most important human obligation, a religious obligation, not only a matter of family. So the union between God and the female counterpart was not only a reparation of a rapture, but also inducing a moment of a sexual union which procreates by creating the souls of men and women. So the vision that I shall try to describe now is as follows. Eros in itself is not so important, but it is part of a larger vision which is very national, tribal, concrete, which emphasizes the importance of continuation of the group and not the perfection of the individual. Such a vision was projected from the human communal life onto God. And God was described in terms which allows the continuation of the group by compelling God to behave as the Jews are supposed to behave. Now I shall enter in a certain elaboration which may be a little bit shocking for some of you, but the examples are numerous, I mean hundreds. And that's not a provocation what I'm doing now. The Kabbalists created a system which will ensure this type of sexual union for the case of procreation. They created a metaphysical system, not a familiar one alone. All of you know for sure 
that uh, the divine structure in Kabbalah involves the existence of ten spherot. That's an important topic, but not the most important one. Within the system of the ten spherot, there is another inner system, which I would like to call it the divine family. The Kabbalists very openly speak about two couples found within the divine structure. One couple are the parents, father and mother. And the other couple, son and daughter. Two couples, in both cases, the sexual relationship is very, very important. And those two couples, in fact, function as a family. Because the terms are used, Abba, Ima, etc., is quite obvious as a family. This holy or divine family is, in fact, functioning as once, at least, the family was functioning for the sake of procreation, not for the well-being of the members of the family, but in order to procreate, which means the first two divine powers called father and mother, procreated by having a son and a daughter, which are two lower spherot, which procreate by having all the souls of Jews or men and women in general. What is interesting in this family is the strong emphasis on sexual union. And I would like to compare it shortly to what we have in the other structure of the holy family found in Christianity. Many people would say, look, uh, this holy family, which I adopt the term from Christianity, no problem, is reminiscent of Christianity. I would like not to enter now in historical debates about it, but I would like to compare what is the meaning of one family versus the other. In the Kabbalistic structure, we have only married persons. In Christianity, we have only singles. Jesus at least for the time being, didn't marry. The father had some form of relationship which was rather aplatonic. Also, the mother was married, but a very interesting marriage with nothing to do with the real structure of Christianity. So here we, we have, in fact, what? Two different types of supernal families which exemplify, in my opinion, the real difference between Judaism and Christianity, which is not a matter of theology. Is Jesus is the son or not? That's a small story. <laughs> I believe seriously it's a small story. The real story, the structure, not the theological structure, but the more profound structure of Judaism has to do with the fact that Eros was not relegated to the spiritual. And there was nothing like a monastery or extreme asceticism in Judaism versus what happens in Christianity, especially early Christianity. In my opinion, that is the big difference. Small divergences, if this is the sun, that is the sun, that's an issue which for sure was emphasized later. But in my opinion, that's not the big difference if we look to the history of the two religions from the point of view of sociology, of what institutions were built upon the assumptions created by a married, holy, uh, family or a single holy family. So what happens in Kabbalah? We have a very strong effort to create the ideal of a positive role of 
corporeal sexual union as the tool for the most important commandment, which is procreation. And there was no way to arrive, according to many Kabbalistic writings, to heaven or to paradise, if someone didn't procreate. It doesn't matter if he was the biggest of all Allahic figures. And if he wrote the most important book in the history of Allah, huh? access to heaven was prevented if he doesn't have children. So here I should like to enter a little bit into a more detailed story about the most important Allahists maybe in the last 800 years, named Joseph Karo. He wrote, as you may know, the most important book in Allah huh? in many, many centuries. So we would say that he was safe. Indeed, he was married at the beginning twice, had two children. And in one single day, the two women with all his children died in whatever empire. So this great Joseph Caro understood that he has no access to heaven. And he is lost. Doesn't matter if he is writing was called Shulchan Aruch. So he tried to marry again and again and again, five times. The last marriage, which marriage of despair, he took an Ashkenazi woman. As a Sephardi, you can imagine. He took an Ashkenazi woman, and this time it worked. He had a son, Yehuda, which remained alive, and so Joseph Karo arrived to heaven. So why do I tell you this story? In order to show that, in fact, that was more important than any book someone can write. This Joseph Caro was described in scholarship in very serious books as an ascetic. So here we have an ascetic who married five times and made all the possible efforts in order to have children. And for him, in fact, the erotic relationship, in general, the relationship with women was central in his mystical writings. Not only a matter of having to marry five times. All his mystical life was dominated by a relationship with feminine powers revealing to him night after night. So here we have some form of relationship in which um, the Eros is on one side the Eros of the Torah. On the other side, the Eros of the Torah is not enough. That's not going to safeguard someone in the in the next world, because he's going to be prevented if he doesn't have children. So here we have, in my opinion, a system in which procreation, which means continuation in a more concrete form with the tribal national existence at the center, is projected on the divine. And also God has to procreate all the time and to continue vertically from God to us by creating souls all the time as the counterpart of the corporeal continuation of the Kabbalist on the horizontal side. This vision, which can be summarized by describing the Jewish ritual as sexualized or eroticized, is not the only vision of Eros in Judaism. It's the most important one. Jews, like Christians, unlike Muslims, learned a lot from Plato. And they adopted also some schemes of spiritual life. 
And from this point of view, we have examples also in today's, in which errors became an intellectual errors. And I would like to speak about one major example. You for sure heard about Maimonides. The most important Jewish philosophers, if there are philosophers in Judaism. So Maimonides, a great Alachi figure, was at the same time a Greek thinker. Not exactly Platonic, but he knew also Plato a little bit. And without reading Hegel, <laughs> he knew that what's important, very important, is intellectual contemplation. Which means, if intellectual contemplation is the most important thing, what's going to happen with his marriage? So from history, we know that for many, many years, the great Maimonides didn't find a good shidduch. You know, he was not married for a long period. When he married, he had just one son, which means that he didn't have access to heaven, because you must have a son and a daughter. And he didn't have time, because of his intellectual errors, to educate this son, which became a mystic. Which I'm not sure that my monodes would enjoy too much to know that his son, grandson, and the great grandson were mystics. That it happens if you don't have children in time, and you cannot educate them. <laughs> so here we have, in fact, two paradigms in Judaism. One paradigm is the Platonic one, represented by the most important Jewish philosopher, who indeed marriage was not part of his uh, agenda. It happened sometime in his life, late, didn't work too, much, too, too well, on the other side, we have this emphasis in Kabbalah, in which marriage is quintessential. From many points of view, you cannot study Kabbalah without being married. Unlike Maimonides, you can study philosophy as a single. There's no problem. Maybe it's easier. Here we have, in fact, two choices, two cultural choices, between Plato on one side, and the biblical emphasis of what can be called corporate personality, meaning the vision of the people of Israel as one big entity, which is the center of religion. If you like to call it election, you can call it by many, many, many names. I'm using the term corporate personality used by biblical scholars. Those two visions, in fact, entered Europe. To a very great extent, Europe became Platonic and not Jewish. It's a nice story that Europe is a Jewish Christian tradition. It's a very, very, very bad approximation. <laughs> From the point of view of uh, the idea of Eros, Plato influenced Europe infinitely more than the Bible not only via the Christian mystics and monasteries, but again and again, you can see Europe returning to Plato in the period of the Renaissance, for example. Plato comes back, had a deep impact. None of you can tell me what is the name of the son of Piccolo Mirando, a great neoplatonist, or Massimo Ficino. There's a reason you cannot tell me the, the names. We can see again and again, in fact, a certain competition between the dualistic vision of Plato, in which spirit versus body is considered to be the major spiritual problem, versus the other type of emphasis, in which Corporeal continuity is conceived to be quintessential to such an extent that even God is portrayed as functioning in terms of procreation and continuation, 
including visions of divine sex, which from time to time are rather shocking if you're going to read Kabbalistic literature. So instead of the Hegelian progress from the material to the spiritual, which means the progress from material eros to spiritual eros, we can see a small minority in Europe adopting and developing and creating, in fact, in a more intense manner, another vision of Eros, which is not so dualistic and not attempting to spiritualize, spiritualize religious life to the extent that it may become a hindrance toward <coughs> continuity. In this history, the concept of the divine feminine part, Shina, plays a very important role. You cannot procreate even if you are God, if you are not married. So for this reason, the Kabbalists developed uh, the figure of the Shina, of the divine femininity, in an unparalleled manner. And we can see the history of Jewish mysticism as the gradual development of a cult for the Shina, which becomes more evident in 16th century Safedian Kabbalah, and then in Hasidis, in which the importance of the feminine is related to this idea of procreation, but becomes even more and more important with time. So I attempted to give you an history of religion. I believe that's the most interesting history of religion we can imagine, to see how two major, very, very powerful approaches to religion, the Platonic and Aristo is just a student of Plato from this point of view, versus the biblical structures encountered, influenced each other, and from time to time refused to enter in some forms of synthesis in the case of the Jewish elite. From time to time, Jews were deeply influenced from Philo via Maimonides up to much later figures like uh, Mendelssohn, for example. But I believe it's possible to write an history of the West, not only by the way in which uh, Michel Foucault did it, but by looking to the tension inherent into two major vectors, the individualism of the intellectuals with their individual perfection, or an attempt to look toward more corporeal units like the Hebrew Bible, and those types of developments and tensions maybe are the history of not only of Eros, but of religion in the West. Thank you very much.